What's up, everybody? Sunday Sessions, episode 42, to deliver a ton of insight about scaling out your Amazon business, regardless of where you are in journey, whether you're just getting started, you're already operating a five, six, seven, or either eight-figure business. It doesn't matter. We've supported entrepreneurs who sell on Amazon at all levels, and we're here to support you, so we're super excited. Um, this is Sunday Sessions. This is a live call I do. Um, as frequently as possible on Sundays to provide tons of information and value to the community of Amazon sellers um, so we can ensure that your businesses are consistently growing month over month, week over week, and year over year. That's the name of the game, right? Financial freedom at its finest, my friends. So super excited to be here. We're going to get right into it. Any questions you have, please let them rip. It's the time. There's no dumb questions. The only dumb question is the one you do not ask. Monica, hello. Shamari, what's up? Morning, let's go, let's go, let's go. Already been working since 10 a.m. So I got four hours into the day, spent from eight to ten. Well, I started at eight. For eight to ten, I did repricing. Ten to today, ten to now, I did some live calls, and now I'm hanging out with y'all. Uh yeah. So Alberto's got a question how we got around the new Amazon workflow. We've actually built our own software, but two softwares that I know that get around the Amazon workflow is the first being Wizard Industries. Um, that would be my primary suggestion for getting around Amazon's workflow. And the second would be 2D workflow. Um, just keep in mind that uh, both come at different price points and uh, both have different capabilities. So, And they bo also both believe I, you can get a two-week trial for both. So try them both out and, and see what works. Uh, Boog over on YouTube just asked, what's some good softwares for beginners? So definitely I'll name three or four softwares you need 100%, whether you're a beginner or medium-sized, large. So keep a 100%. You need AZ Insight to run profit calculations on an Amazon listing. Um, some sort of UPC scraper, we suggest Scan Unlimited. Um, and those are really essentially the three softwares you'll need to really get some momentum moving in your business. You know, it's very straightforward. It's a very inexpensive business model to um, get started with. Stefano asks, Eric, do you recommend selling shoes on Amazon? So I used to be in the shoe game. You know, we did in 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic, we did close to $2 million in shoe sales. And when we ran the numbers, the net margins were about two percentage points because of returns. So we did $2 million in sales to make, you know, $20,000, um, which is very, very small for the investment of inventory. Um, so we prefer to not sell shoes because the return rates are so high. You know, there's three categories we personally stay away from. Now, I know some sellers, that's their main focus, but I personally stay away from them. The first category is shoes. Return rate average 14 to 18 percent. Second category is apparel. Same average return rate, 14 to 18 percent. Third category, high end consumer electronics. Same exact game plan. 14 to 18 percent. What we sell and we focus on selling is consumable products, products that people reorder and reuse, especially grocery items because the return rate is very low. Our company operates at a two percent return rate. MM asked, when sourcing catalogs, do you mix a manual of brand searches on Amazon along with UPC scraping with Scan Unlimited? Absolutely, we do. So there's four main steps to product research that we use in our process. The first is using a UPC scraper and placing a reorder, right? So uploading the catalog to the UPC scraper so you have all the UPCs and the ASIN connections and the pricing, and then going through your current inventory and reordering products that you already have data in. This will give you a solid foundation of your order, right? So let's say in the reorder, you're able to add 10 products and put together a $5,000 order, right? What this allows you to do, if you needed to get that inventory in immediately, you could submit that order and get that order shipped to you, right? So adding a reorder is step number one. Step number two, we take that Excel catalog and we sort it in our UPC scraper by highest profit first, right? Obviously with our BSR requirements, for us, it's usually less than 200K, greater than one, um, but we set our uh, profit sort by highest profit sort first. So first we added all the restocks and now we're gonna add all the highest profiting items first. Now, normally the highest profiting items will be selling the least amount of volume a month. The closer you get to lower margins, the more 
items will sell on a monthly basis. So a healthy mix of high BSR, high profit, and low BSR, low profit is really going to allow you to scale out your Amazon business operation, right? Step number three would be doing some freestyling in the catalog, right? Because some UPCs are going to have different connections. Some pack sizes might not come up correct. You know, you might already be purchasing some products that you want to add. So what we do is freestyling by brand searches. Let's say there's a um, Doritos, right, in the catalog. I'd do a Dorito search. I wouldn't do a specific individual description search of each line item. You know, Doritos Cool Ranch, Doritos Nacho. I would just do a generic Dorito search and then look at the products listed on Amazon and reference them through the catalog. And now the fourth step is going back through your final order, right, reviewing it to make any final changes and looking for additional pack sizes you could be selling. Because you might have bought the two pack, but you missed the three pack. You might have bought the three pack, but you missed the six pack and the 12 pack. So you're going to add additional SKUs or additional ASINs for SKUs and item numbers you're already purchasing, which will allow you to double down on increasing the size of the order. And that's how we do reorders. And we rinse, wash, and repeat every single day of the week. Best for price are for beginners. So I usually say if you're just starting off, um, be cool. And then usually between, I'd say, five to $25,000 a month, we su suggest go Aura. And then anything really over greater than $20,000, $25,000 a month, we suggest sell or snap. I have 10K. What do you recommend to start wholesale business or OA in order to grow capital for further stepping to wholesale? You can actually do both. So I would probably split it up 60-40. I would take 6000 of that. I would dump it into two or three wholesale orders. I would take the other 4,000 of that to build up capital. Um, so while you're waiting for those wholesale orders to come in, you still have cash to raise funds for your business and continue operating your systems. Um, who do you have to contact for your trophy? So it looks like Carson achieved an award and you sell as a ride. What, what, what award have you achieved, Carson? First of all, congratulations. So trophies ship out. Um, at the end of the year, usually around October, so right around the beginning of October, end of September, we will put a, um, a Google Doc into the Facebook group so we can get your shipping info, the name you'd like on your trophy, and then we'll mail those out at the end of the year to you. All right. Cars and cleaning. In your experience, what is a healthy or average PCPA? Right around a dollar would be a healthy or average PCPA. You know, ours without our web development team is right around a dollar and with our web development team is a little higher. You know, we got some people in our community who operate at $1.50, some people operate at 60, 70 cents. Um, so right around a dollar is pretty healthy PCPA. And if for anybody who doesn't know what PCPA is, PCPA, and I have a great video right here on YouTube explaining it. PCPA is your production cost per ASIN. It's essentially the cost it takes for you to get one product into your facility or into your prep center and out the door to Amazon, right? So from your vendor to Amazon for sale, your production cost per ASIN. It's a very easy number to get. You simply divide your monthly expenses by the monthly order shipped to Amazon, and that'll give you your PCPA. Hi, I'm from Ukraine. Thanks for what you do, sir. He thanks for what you do. And I hope everything's okay since those earthquakes over in Ukraine right now. It's very unfortunate. Uh, when did you hire your first employee and what was the process like? So first employee is definitely a packer. Your first employee is going to be a packer. So for us, we put a, a, an ad on Craigslist. You know, we had some interviews come by and we hired um, our first packer. You know, and it's funny that first packer actually stayed with us for almost six and a half years. He just left the company about six or seven months ago. So, um, Yeah. He became, you know, went from a packer to working in the warehouse, then became our warehouse manager, and we promote from within. So, and that's how I started on Amazon as well. Sebastian hired me about nine years ago as a packer in his warehouse. You know, I was packing products. Um, and then I became a buyer, manager, you know, CEO, and it kind of grew from there. Uh, yeah, we have a course. You can send me a message on Instagram. It's so much more than a course, too. It's it's a community. There's live weekly coaching every Monday night for multiple months when you join. Private Facebook access is a lot. Uh, we do not do any FBM. So right right at the middle of the pandemic, like right when really the, the FBM sales started slowing down, we decided to completely nix FBM in our company. And the reason why is because I'm, I'm a data 
business. Obviously, I sell on Amazon. I teach people how to sell on Amazon. And the way we grow our Amazon business is by analyzing data and running the numbers and then eliminating what didn't work and doubling down on what works. So when I looked at our, our FBM prep station on a daily production basis, right, based on our average profit per sale, um, which is about 350, you know, our production station for FBM was producing about 150 to 200 orders a day, right? And it was taking two people to do that, right? So what we thought is like, okay, we have FBA and our average FPA station does about 2,500 orders a day. So all we have to do is add two more employees and we 20X our daily production. Why are we selling FBM at all? Just didn't make logical sense. So we completely eliminated FBM. Now we're 100% FBA. And it's eliminated a lot of headaches just from dealing with the customer complaints, the customer emails, the returns, the tracking numbers. It really, really changed the game for us. I'm from outside of the U.S. Is Florida a good state to form an LLC in or does your course include instructions on forming entities, bank accounts and et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. Our program, you know, we show you how to register your LLC. We discuss um, what states we recommend. And honestly, if you're out of the country, I would suggest opening your LLC in like Wyoming or Delaware, uh, a, a tax free state. It just makes more logical sense. Um, for the sellers and e-sellers or I in Canada, are they doing LTL or F or SPD? So there's an assortment. We got some doing SPD over the border as well as in Canada. And then we have some doing LTL. And we've actually had a few recently start doing full truckloads um, to Amazon Canada fulfillment centers as well as U.S. fulfillment centers. Uh, no, we do sell toys in Q4. You know, toys make up a small portion of our catalog, but we definitely sell toys, especially in Q4. I actually just got off a phone call at, at 1.30 with a seller who uh, he's only selling toys. He lives over in California and he's looking to grow his business. You know, the California market's great for toys because it's so close to China. So they get most of the toys in, right? Over on the New York side, you get a lot of health and beauty products. Um, so definitely geographics plays a role in the growth of your Amazon business. And that what makes it so that's what makes it so cool, right? Because yeah, there's competition everywhere, but like for me, I don't do much business with vendors out in California because the cost of shipping is too much. And then when I when I weigh the the expenses of prep centers, it's just sometimes the numbers don't make sense. So like that creates opportunity for all you West Coast cats, you know? So there's always room to grow here. Uh, how do you find grocery distributors? Google, man. Google keywords, grocery wholesalers, whatever state you live in, right? Grocery distributors, insert whatever state you live in. Grocery um, distributors, insert whatever portion of the country you live in. And then you want to start locally and branch out from there. You know, start locally, then go regional, then go national. Um, what does my day look like as an e-commerce business owner now? So it absolutely looks completely different than it used to look. I still work a lot. You know, but now I have more freedom and time freedom to enjoy the things that I like to enjoy. So realistically, I probably spend about 20, 25 hours a week on my actual Amazon business. Um, the rest of the time I spend helping other people like yourself grow your Amazon businesses, right? So I'm still very involved in the day to day. I go to the office four days a week. Um, I really thrive at the office. I like to be surrounded by people. I like the motivation of being able to go in the warehouse, see the products get received. It just keeps me super, super motivated and intrigued. Um, and it really helps me level up every day when I walk into that space and I see the vision of like, this is what we have to work with. Like we need to get as many products as here possible because I want to make, you know, so much money. I want to have my employees have good lives and be able to pay for their, their food and their families. And like, it's just very invigorating me to show up every day. So um, usually I spend the first half of the, the day focusing on my Amazon business and the second half of my day I focus on. Um, you know, building building out systems to help all of you grow. Um, how did you deal with authenticity complaints in the past for products you purchased from Costco with a POS receipt? Yeah, so the receipts are going to be tough. Um, but what I found works well is an invoice from their online um, website. It's easier. I find that a, a, web, a website invoice from an online purchase from Costco works better than a digital or a physical receipt. It's a great question. For morality impulse, he said, 
Hello, Eric. How old were you when you got into the game? I'm 28 and feel like I'm way behind compared to some of these young guys in the seller space. I got into Amazon when I was about 27 years old, 28 years old. So I was your age, right? And at the time, I had absolutely nothing going for me. I had zero dollars in my bank account. My bank account was negative. Sleeping on friends' couches, I had absolutely nothing going for myself. You know, I had zero hope. And I started selling on Amazon. It absolutely changed my life. You know, and now here we are, what, seven, eight years later, nine years later, and uh, I wouldn't have done it any other way, I'll tell you that. If you were starting again with 20K, would you go straight to wholesale or OA? Straight to wholesale, 20K, that's a substantial amount of money. So Sarah asks, is it okay to work with distributors or we need to set up an account directly with a brand if they allow and what's the difference between them? Um, so typically when you open an account with a wholesaler or distributor, they'll send you and cause they're no, they'll know you're an e-commerce seller, right? And selling on Amazon because the conversation is going to come off. They're going to ask you where you sell your products, right? So usually what they'll do is they'll send you a list of products with brands that you're allowed to sell on Amazon, right? They'll remove the e-commerce non-friendly brands, right? So it's going to make your life very easy. Um, now when you're working with brands, it's a little more complicated. Right. Because the brands are usually looking for established businesses to help them scale out their brand sales on Amazon.com. And if you're fairly new to the game and you don't really have that experience, you're not going to really know how to navigate the brand relationship, brand registry, PPC campaigns, listing optimization, SEO optimization, um, and really scaling out that side of the business. Proper forecasting, right? Managing repricing, um, dealing with uh, customer inquiries and complaints. Like these are all things you need to get a handle on before you can go brand direct. Um, so really the biggest difference is brand direct is more for an experienced seller who's trying to scale out their operations by helping grow other brands and wholesalers and distributors are just a quick way to get into the game. So I always suggest partnering with wholesalers and distributors first because they're going to be much easier to get products from. And then obviously use the Keepa chart to make sure there's no IP complaints on the listing. You know, you're looking for sharp drops on that third offer count chart and you're analyzing that data to make sure that there's no potential um, issues with that listing before purchasing it. Sonny said, how do you know which wholesalers Amazon accepts or not? You can just simply ask them, hey, has anybody ever used your invoice for approval? It's a very common question. J-Dub said, hey, Eric, how important is feedback count in affecting the buy box? It's, it's pretty important. Um, it's not the only factor that plays a role. I'll cover some of the other factors. But it plays a substantial role, especially if the seller that you're talking about that has 200,000 reviews um, has has more consistency on those listings than you have. They will dominate the listing. Um, so first, I'm going to cover some of the other things that determine why Amazon gives the buy box to certain sellers. And then I'm going to cover a trick to help bump you into the buy box. Okay. So Amazon determines a few pieces of information to decide who gets in the buy box. Um, fulfillment method, FBA versus FBM price point, uh, seller feedback, seller rating, history on the listing, inventory in stock, location that the customer is purchasing from compared to the location that your inventory is in fulfillment centers. And then there's maybe one or two more I'm missing in there. So Amazon analyzes all of that information to make an educated decision who is going to be in the buy box for that specific point of day. Now, Jay, you're having trouble getting into the buy box. So let me give you some tips on how to bump yourself into the buy box. First tip would be a coupon. Repricers do not detect coupons. So if you and the other seller are both selling the product at $20, the minimum coupon you could put is a 5% coupon. So your product would be listed at $19, but their repricer will not detect that you have a 5% coupon. So their price will still be at 20 and your price would be at 19 because you have the option where the customer can add a 5% coupon. Now, why does this make sense? Amazon makes money off of coupons, 60 cents for every clipped coupon or every redeemed coupon rather, right? So if they can make an extra 60 cents on you and provide a discount to the end consumer, do you not think that Amazon may prompt you into the buy box a little more often so they can make more money and give more value to the end consumer? Absolutely, they will. The second tip I'll provide to you is run some PPC campaigns. Talking 10 to $15 daily budgets, very low bids, five to 15 cents per budget.
Um, well, you're...